Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is the third session of New York Arbitration Week. We are presented today with ASIL, and we're going to be talking about race judicata. But before we get to the topic in chief, allow me to say what a pleasure it is to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee. Our co-chairs are in the audience and they are excitedly waiting to greet you during the networking session to follow this, both remote and in person. Of course, we could not do it without our sponsors. Michelle, if you could bring those up, please. Next slide. Here we go, we couldn't do, out, do it without our financial sponsors, as well as our supporting entities displayed on the next slide. And our co-chairs for this year are Lee Haver Cock and Matt Draper, and they appear on the next slide. And thereafter, you'll see the complete organizing committee. Next slide, there we go. Okay, Michelle, you can stop sharing. With that, just to remind you, the theme this year, getting it right in international arbitration, broadly defined through the different segments and sessions that will tease this out. And without further ado, allow me to hand the mic to Emma Lindsay, who will be taking us into session. Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you, Reka. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we are here for an Oxford-style debate on race judicata in international arbitration. Um, as Reka mentioned, this panel is sponsored by the American Society of International Law. Uh, thanks to ASIL and New York Arbitration Week, especially this year's co-chairs, Matt and Lee, and the entire organizing committee. I'm delighted to serve as the moderator for this session. Uh, my name is Emma Lindsay, and I'm a partner at Withers here in New York, where I lead our international arbitration and public international law team. Let me now introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, first, let's start with our debaters. Simon Batifor, a partner at Curtis Millay, Provost Coach and Mosul in Brussels in New York. His practice is, focuses on investment arbitration, commercial arbitration, and public international law. Uh, our second debater is Ben Love. Ben is an international arbitration partner in the New York and Washington DC offices of Boyce, Schiller and Flexner. He has represented clients in numerous commercial and investment treaty arbitrations, including many disputes that have given rise to multiple arbitrations and some of the same issues in debate today. Turning then to our distinguished tribunal, our presiding arbitrator today is Lucinda Lowe. Lucinda is a partner at Steptoe & Johnson and serves as the firm's international practice leader and co-chair of its international arbitration practice group. She's a member of the ICSID panel of arbitrators appointed by the World Bank president and the ICSID panel of conciliators appointed by the US president and served as president of the American Society of International Law from 2016 to 2018. Uh, turning then to our co-arbitrators, Ben Jaratowicz QC is an independent barrister based at Essex Court Chambers with a practice covering arbitration, both commercial and investment, cases between states and cases in domestic courts related to arbitration or international law. Uh, the second co-arbitrator this afternoon is Carmen Martinez-Lopez, a partner in the London office of Three Crowns. She has appeared as advocate in numerous investment treaty and commercial arbitrations, both under the rules of the major arbitral institutions and ad hoc, and involving a variety of jurisdictions with a particular focus on Latin America and Spain. Carmen also sits as an arbitrator. Let me uh, then turn to an important disclaimer on behalf of all the panelists uh, who will be speaking this afternoon. The positions taken and the views and opinions expressed in this debate are solely for purposes of the debate, to encourage a spirited exchange and allow us to engage with as many relevant issues as possible. The views expressed by our speakers during the debate do not necessarily reflect their actual views and should not be attributed to them, their firms, their clients, or any institution with which they are affiliated. With that out of the way, let's turn to the motion before us today. The motion before us is an, arbitral's tribunal, an arbitral tribunal's decision should bind other arbitral tribunals subsequently deciding related disputes on the same issues of fact or law. This raises a number of interesting issues, uh, which, which I know our debaters and our tribunal will touch on. What is the significance of deciding first in time 
Should a distinction be made between legal and factual issues? Should the legal basis of the cause of action alter the analysis? What is the significance of having different parties in different arbitrations? So how are we going to tackle this? Uh, round one will be for the debaters uh, to lay out their opening positions with Simon arguing in favor of the motion and Ben arguing against. We'll then have a period for comments and questions from the tribunal uh, before our debaters return for round two, where they will respond to the tribunal's questions, uh, handle rebuttal uh, before we move to tribunal deliberation, which will occur in public uh, and the tribunal's decision. There will be time at the end, I hope, for audience questions and comments, please. Use the chat, the Q&A and the chat function, submit questions and comments as we go along. We'll get to as many of them as we can after the debate. Uh, we will also be doing some polling. Uh, so we'll start with a poll to get delegates initial views on the motion and end with a poll to see whether the arguments put forward in the debate have shifted the audience's views. Uh, let's do the first poll please before I hand over to the debaters for round one. Do you agree, disagree with the motion, or do you not know yet? We'll give a minute for the results to come in. Please do vote. So the results are in. It appears about a, a third of the audience uh, agree with the motion, nearly half disagree, and a minority don't know yet. Uh, we'll see if that, that changes as our, our session draws to a close. Uh, so thank you for your views on that. Um, I will uh, now hand over to our debaters. Simon Ben, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Emma, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Madam Chair, members of the Tribunal, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Simon Batifor, and I will be presenting in favor of the motion. Let's keep in mind at the outset what the motion is about. The motion is not about what the actual role is in arbitration as a general matter, but rather what the role should be. The motion concerns successive arbitral decisions involving related disputes on the same issues. So the debate is not about whether there should be a general rule of precedent in all arbitrations, whether they may be related or not. The question is also not whether an arbitral tribunal should be bound by a previous decision regarding the same dispute. That question is addressed by the principle of res judicata which dictates that litigants should not be able to relitigate the same issues when the disputes are identical in all respects. The question today is whether this kind of reasoning should apply not just to arbitrations concerning the same dispute, but also those concerning related disputes. Related disputes can involve different but related parties. They can involve related claims based on different causes of action, such as claims under a contract and claims under a treaty. They can involve variations in the request for relief. So the key question is, should such factors allow the second tribunal to disregard the findings of the first one on the same issues? In answering this question, I could recite Latin maxims on the importance of putting an end to litigation, coherence in legal decisions or due process. But I think it's more useful to be concrete. So I'll refer to three actual cases involving related disputes, one from 2001, one from 2010, and one from 2017, which are helpful in forming an understanding. 
The case from 2001, still the early days of investment arbitration, is a cautionary tale. That year, the tribunal in CME v. Czech Republic rendered a decision that was completely inconsistent with the earlier decision rendered in the Lauder case against the Czech Republic. The first tribunal in Lauder found in favor of the Czech Republic on most of the underlying issues of fact and law. It rejected almost all of the allegations of treaty breach, and it dismissed the claims for damages in their entirety. The second case brought by Mr. Lauder's company, CME, involved the same factual circumstances, claims for the same harm concerning the alleged expropriation of the same broadcasting license. The CME tribunal itself acknowledged that the two cases were virtually identical. Yet the CME tribunal disregarded the first tribunal's decision, upheld all of CME's claims and ordered the Czech Republic to pay approximately $300 million in damages. In doing so, the tribunal made findings of fact and law that were diametrically opposed to the findings of the first tribunal. The key finding of the first tribunal was that the state's decision to require a change in the structure of the investment was, quote, based on objective grounds and aimed to prevent breaches of local law. But the CME tribunal found that the state took the same decision in an intentional effort to coerce the claimants into surrendering their rights and to destroy the investment. The, tri the CME tribunal saw the louder decision, but it said that whatever that tribunal had found did not matter because the parties were technically different, the company its, and its majority shareholder, and the claims were based on different investment treaties with comparable, as the tribunal said, but not identical protections. And therefore the triple identity test for res judicata was not met. The CME decision was widely criticized. Charles Brower called it the most graphic example of the risk of multiple and conflicting, conflicting awards in arbitration. Zachary Douglas said that a respondent cannot be expected to defend a barrage of concurrent or consecutive claims relating to precisely the same prejudice to a single investment. Susan Frank warned that any system where diametrically opposed decisions can legally coexist cannot last long. Other commentators were even more blunt, stating that CME made the arbitration process look like a legal casino was the ultimate fiasco in investment arbitration. Is there a better way to handle decisions rendered in related disputes? Well, a case from 2010 RSM v. Granada provides a roadmap. Like in CME, there had been a previous decision taken in a related dispute. In the first case, RSM had sued Granada for breach of a petroleum agreement relying on the contractual arbitration clause. Tribunal rejected the claims, finding that Granada had not breached any of its obligations under the contract. Then a second arbitration was commenced concerning the same petroleum agreement. The claimants this time were not just RSM, but also its three shareholders. And they brought claims not under the petroleum contract, but under the bilateral investment treaty between the US and Granada. They said to the second tribunal, you're not bound by the findings of the first tribunal because we're not trying to relitigate a breach of contract case. They said, we're bringing only treaty claims. It's well established that the fact that there may be no breach of contract does not mean that there's no breach of treaty. The RSM tribunal, like in CME, could have said, well, I'm not bound by the previous tribunal's findings because the claimants and causes of action are not exactly the same. But the RSM tribunal did not follow that route. Even though the two cases involved different causes of action, what mattered was that the first tribunal had issued findings on a series of issues that were also in dispute in the second case including the interpretation of the rights and obligations under the petroleum agreement. That was also the investment or the alleged investment in the treaty case. And even though the individual claimants were not part of the first arbitration, they're shareholders of the company and therefore could not expect to effectively overturn the first tribunal's findings. Unlike CME, the RSM tribunal was unwilling 
to establish a parallel reality with different findings of fact and law, simply because there was no strict identity of parties or causes of action. Now, fast forward to 2017 with the award rendered in Oraskam v. Algeria. Oraskam also involved parallel proceedings, but unlike in the other cases I mentioned, there had been no other decision rendered yet. Yet the tribunal found that it was an abusive process for claimants in the same corporate chain to even initiate multiple related proceedings. And it dismissed the case on that basis. Tribunal noted that its decision was in line with the reasoning in RSM as it relied on the same rationale of avoiding that claims involving the same economic damage be adjudged twice. It also noted the CME precedent, but observed that, quote, in the 15 years that have followed the CME louder cases, the investment treaty jurisprudence has evolved, close quote, with an increasing recognition of the problems raised by parallel proceedings. We're not debating today the question at issue in Oraskam of whether related claimants should be preventing, prevented from initiating multiple proceedings. But Oraskam underscores the reasonableness of the narrower proposition we're debating of whether the findings in a previous decision in a related dispute should be respected. In some cases, such as RSM and Oraskam, show that a tribunal should not ignore the existence of other arbitrations involving related disputes, let alone disregard the findings of fact or law reached in such cases. A tribunal that disregards the findings of a previous tribunal in a related dispute creates a parallel reality of fact and law that is unfathomable and contrary to the rule of law. The opposite view is unsustainable as exemplified by the old CME case, the ultimate fiasco in international arbitration. Madam Chair, members of the tribunal, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you, members of the tribunal and uh, the organizers for facilitating uh, this uh, debate today. Um, so I'm tasked with um, arguing against the motion, um, which I think Simon set out the issues quite well. But the motion should be denied for one fundamental reason, and that is it is beyond the mandate of an international tribunal to issue a decision that binds another international tribunal in a separate case, in particular, simply because that tribunal decided first in time. The role of international tribunals is to decide the disputes before them, for the parties before them, on the basis of the law applicable in that particular dispute. And just as an international tribunal cannot bind another, uh, without exceeding its own mandate or attempt to bind another. A subsequent tribunal that is tasked with deciding a dispute before it would be failing to fulfill its mandate if it simply deferred the decision on an issue before it to another tribunal that had already decided that issue. Now, as Professor Riesman observed in his 2013 Freshfields lecture, international arbitrators are law are not lawmakers, they are law appliers. And accordingly, he noted, and I quote, they should confine themselves to their case specific mandate and refrain from departing from it to take into account of what arbitrators may conceive to be the systemic implications of their decision. Now this broad proposition cuts across a number of issues, but it also has implications for today's debate, whether in the context of international commercial, or investment arbitration. Now, denying the motion does not preclude arbitrators from considering how other tribunals have decided over overlapping issues of fact and law. On the contrary, it is entirely appropriate for an international tribunal to consider relevant reasoning and evidence on the issues before it, including reason and evidence that may be available to it from other proceedings. But in doing so, the second tribunal to decide is not and must not purport to be bound by a decision simply because it was issued earlier in time. 
Rather, the second tribunal has a mandate and indeed a duty to draw its own conclusions on the issues before it as a primary matter. A tribunal's duty to fulfill its mandate, to get it right, both allows and compels this conclusion. So now Simon has raised three very interesting examples from investment treaty arbitration, um, you know, which he, he cites to support the motion. So let's address them. Starting with the CME Lauder saga, there are two points to address here. The first is that these two separate arbitrations that concern the same economic interest in the same respondent state were brought under two separate treaties. And the claimant initially attempted to consolidate them, but it was the state, not the investors, who chose not to consolidate these claims into one proceeding. Now, why is that? Well, we can only speculate as to why, but it illustrates an important point, which is that the default position in international arbitration, and this is the case both for treaty and contract arbitration, is that each arbitral tribunal that is established under a separate arbitral mechanism has its own case-specific mandate. And absent party consent, those separate mechanisms produce separate proceedings with their own constituent elements and distinct mandates. And this is by design. This is how the system was designed to operate. Um, now, the second point that the CME Lauder saga raises is the point about first in time and just how much does it matter? Because those who are arguing that the CME tribunal should have followed the Lauder decision are effectively arguing that because the Lauder tribunal decided first, it should bind the CME tribunal. But the notion that an international tribunal tasked under a separate arbitral mechanism with deciding overlapping issues only has a mandate to reach an independent decision on those issues, so long as another tribunal does not reach that decision first, is obviously wrong. It would create the per perverse incentive for tribunals in related disputes to compete on time, sacrificing accuracy and due process in their deliberations for speed to ensure their views win the day. And that is not an arbitral system that any rational litigant would desire, nor is it the one we have. Rather, we have one that permits and compels each tribunal in its specific case to get it right. Now, the case of RSM versus Granada presents a wholly different set of circumstances to CME Lauder. They can't be compared. There, um, the claimants were serial litigants well known for filing abusive and frivolous litigation. And you know, as Simon had set out, RSM first tried to uh, make its claims under a contract. And when it failed, it tried again to make those same claims under a treaty. And it brought along with it 100% um, of its uh, shareholders as co-claimants. Um, so unlike CME Lauder, where two different claimants had two different treaty mechanisms um, and the state chose to maintain their separateness, RSM was a claimant in both cases, which were brought uh, sequentially. And we have to remember here a very important point, which is that doctrines such as race judicata and collateral estoppel bind parties, not adjudicators. So RSM would naturally have difficulty relitigating issues that had already been decided in a separate arbitration that had also commenced under the same, against the same respondent state. Now, it is significant here that the first RSM tribunal, and we'll call it the contract tribunal, had primary jurisdiction to decide disputed issues of contract between RSM and the, and the respondent state, and that it did that. Now, the second tribunal, constituted under a treaty, simply refused to re-adjudicate decided issues of contract, over which it only had secondary jurisdiction as a treaty tribunal. So contrary to supporting today's motion, the RSM decision really supports a much narrower proposition. And, and to quote the tribunal in, in its decision, that proposition is that BIT tribunals 
do not reopen the, the municipal law decisions of competent fora absent a denial of justice. That is not to say that uh, tribunals deciding second in time must always defer to those who decided first, but that tribunals constituted under a treaty in the specific circumstance do not relitigate um, decided issues of municipal law, including issues of contract. Now, the third case that uh, Simon discussed, Worskam versus Algeria, you know, as, as he acknowledged, um, is not really on point for the motion uh, because what it concerns is a tribunal not following the decisions of a previous tribunal or purporting to bind subsequent tribunals with its decision, but rather a tribunal that abdicated from its mandate altogether on grounds of alleged abuse uh, by the claimant um, and dismissed the claim um, altogether. So whether or not this was a step too far outside the scope of the tribunal's enumerated powers, it is neither here nor there for the motion in this debate. Now, there's a fourth set of cases that I think are um, illustrate why the motion is flawed. And these four cases arise out of a dispute um, following the termination of gas supply from Egypt to Israel. So the first case was a Cairo seated arbitration where the tribunal had the primary task of deciding the validity of the termination of the upstream gas supply contract in the project. The second case was a Geneva seated ICC tribunal where um, that had the primary uh, mandate to decide whether a related tripartite agreement that involved a third party um, had been properly uh, terminated as well. And in deciding that, it had to, as an incidental matter, uh, decide the same issues that were before the Cairo Tribunal. Now, the shareholders for um, the uh, claiming party in each of these arbitrations brought their own treaty arbitrations under separate treaties. Uh, one was Nixit arbitration and the other was Nunstrop arbitration. So that, that's the stage that was set with this dispute. Now, what happened? The tribunal that decided first in time was the ICC tripartite agreement tribunal. And in doing so, um, it decided a number of the issues, uh, really nearly all of the issues that were before the Cairo seated uh, tribunal. Um, the second tribunal to decide was the uh, ICSID tribunal, which was of course deciding uh, breaches of treaty. Now that ICSID tribunal more or less followed the motion at issue today and considered that the ICC tribunal's findings uh, with respect to contract, uh, contractual issues and factual issues were raised judicata um, before it. But that presented the problem of course, because the Cairo tribunal had not yet decided. So when the, the Cairo tribunal had to decide um, issues of breach of contract including and, and issues of fact, including many that the ICC tribunal had already decided and the ICSID tribunal had already adopted. It considered that as the tribunal with primary jurisdiction over the contract before it, it had to reach its own independent decision. In other words, it had to satisfy itself of that it had the right answer. So while it largely uh, reached some of the same conclusions as the ICC and ICSID tribunals, it did not do so by applying uh, the motion or any notion of um, race judicata, rather it reached that decision independently, um, which left a fourth tribunal, um, which was the second treaty tribunal uh, constituted on the UNCTRA rules um, with a dilemma, whether it would follow the ICC tribunal on matters of contract, in fact, as the ICSID tribunal had done, and indeed whether it would follow the ICSID tribunal on overlapping issues of treaty interpretation or application, or whether it would take an entirely different route and follow uh, the Cairo tribunal on matters of contractual interpretation and reach its own decision on matters of treaty. Um, and there was a third option, of course, which is that it would decide independently altogether. Well, the NSA trial tribunal took a, a different position. It did not follow the motion. It did not follow um, first in time rules. It said the issue before us really turns on 
whether gas supply was terminated in accordance with the contract. That is an incidental issue to deciding whether the state had also breached the treaty. And with regard to those questions of contract and those questions of contract loan, the UNSA trial tribunal decided that the Cairo tribunal's decision was a matter of race judicata, not unlike the um, RSM tribunal deciding that uh, the RSM contract tribunal's decisions were race judicata in the treaty case. But what this illustrates is the danger of transposing, wholly transposing national court rules like race judicata and collateral estoppel into the arbitral context. Um, it's not only wrong because it's inconsistent with the case specific mandate of tribunals, it can be positively dangerous and lead to uh, drastically incoherent results. And that's because unlike the domestic systems that gave birth to those concepts, international arbitration is not designed to operate as a system. Rather, unlike national courts, arbitral tribunals have a case specific mandate and they may consider any evidence put before them. And that can include decisions in related arbitrations, but they cannot and should not purport to be bound by those decisions simply because they may have come first in time. Thank you. Thank you to Ben and Simon for those opening presentations. I'll now hand things over to our arbitral tribunal, Madam President. Thank you very much, Emma. And let me first congratulate uh, both Simon and Ben for their very cogent and thoughtful presentations on this issue. Uh, it is an issue that I think the case examples illustrate is arising perhaps with increasing frequency uh, in, in, in the world of arbitration and, and, and many of them cross over between commercial and investor state. Uh, as the examples involving both contract and treaty disputes really demonstrate. Uh, the tribunal, I suspect, does have quite a number of questions raised by these presentations. And I'm going to ask each of my colleagues in turn if they would uh, set forth their questions. And I will see after that if anything remains for me to ask. Uh, let me just remind our, our uh, Simone and Ben that, that you will have an opportunity in your rebuttal remarks following this, this discussion to address those questions. So as much as you may be tempted at this point to jump in, please restrain yourselves and, and the opportunity will come in due course. So let me start with my esteemed tribunal member, Carmen Martinez Lopez. Uh, for her questions on your respective submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Ben and, and Simon, for this excellent presentations. I do have uh, two questions for both parties. Um, as Mr. Batiford explained, there are arguably a number of important policy considerations that would support a broad interpretation of res judicata, procedural efficiency, legal coherence, the principle of finality, et cetera. Now, I, I know Mr. Love uh, may disagree, but let's assume uh, for a moment that this is indeed the case. Yet, could we achieve those policy considerations simply by other means, such as introducing specific language in the applicable BIT for treaty cases such as the CME Lauder saga? or by applying or even developing mechanisms just as, such as consolidation or the doctrine of abuse of rights if applicable. So in other words, do we need to expand the application of the doctrine of res judicata to meet these policy considerations? Or do we already have enough mechanisms in our toolkit to do so? That would be my first question. And I do have a, another one which relates to the RSM saga that both parties referred to as well. And I must confess that I find the starting point for that decision to be somehow surprising. And I'm specifically referring to the language that I'm, that I'm about to quote, which says, quote, the doctrine of collateral estoppel is now established as a general principle of law applicable by international courts and tribunals, end of quote. 
And I find it surprising because while I, I would agree that the traditional res judicata as, as in claim preclusion principle appears indeed to be a general principle of law, collateral estoppel, also referred to as issue preclusion, is not generally recognized in civil law countries. And in fact, the tribunal in RSM did not explain the basis for, for, this, for this statement that it did form part of uh, the general principles of law. Maybe it didn't do so because both parties in that specific arbitration appeared to accept that that was the case, but, but it didn't explain the basis for that conclusion. And so I have two specific questions with, with uh, respect to this language in the RSM um, um, award. The first one is, was the RSM tribunal right that indeed the doctrine of collateral estoppel is now established as a general principle of law? applicable by international courts and tribunals. And I absolutely appreciate the point that was made by Mr. Batiford at the beginning of his remarks that we're talking about what, what should be applied by tribunals, not necessarily what, what is being applied by tribunals. Still, I would be interested in, in a response to, to this question. And my second uh, question, which goes to uh, uh, Mr. Batiford's point, assuming that I am correct that issue preclusion is not recognized in a number of civil law systems. Does it make sense to argue that an international arbitral tribunal should be bound by the, bind, by the findings of law or fact of a previous arbitral tribunal when in those civil law legal systems, a national court is not similarly bound by the findings of law or fact of another national court, unless of course they meet the stricter requirement of claim preclusion? Thank you very much, um, Carmen. And now let me turn to my other co-arbitrator, uh, another Ben, uh, not to be confused with Ben Love, but Ben Jaratovich, uh, for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Madam President. <clears throat> I have two questions for Mr. Batifor and one for Mr. Love. And my, my first question for Mr. Batifor <laughs> arises from what he said about abusive process and the Arascom case in particular, as I understood it, you were saying that we're not debating whether claims that are related can even be brought because that's an abusive process question. But you were saying, I think, that the logic of that is consistent with your argument because it seeks to maintain consistency between different decisions. I wonder if it really does help your argument, because I can understand applying an abusive process analysis that a tribunal might sensibly prevent a claim even from being brought because the parties are too close together, the facts are too close, the cause of action is too close, whatever the issue might be giving rise to the abusive process, the claim is stopped at the beginning because for one reason or another it's abusive and that's a flexible concept. That I understand. But if it's not stopped at the beginning, doesn't it follow that it must at least be conceivable that at the end of the process, when the merits are determined, the answer might be different? Because if it's not abusive, then that party can bring that claim. And at the end of the arbitral process, it's open to that tribunal to reach a different decision. Because having not been an abusive process and not being caught by raised judicata or some other applicable doctrine, it's then open to it to reach a different decision. That, that's my first question, if you could help me understand why that concept's not in fact against your argument rather than for it. My second question shorter, and it's really a procedural one. You talked about successive arbitral decisions. What if they're not successive? What if the two claims are on foot at the same time? What happens then? Should one tribunal issue a stay and wait for the other? And if that's so, which one? How do they decide? Would you accept Mr. Love's distinction between primary jurisdiction and secondary jurisdiction, such that the secondary tribunal should stay its hand until the primary tribunal, at least for that question, has issued its decision? So I'd be very interested to know how you see matters when the decisions aren't successive, but the claims are concurrent. Those are my two questions to Mr. Batifor. For Mr. Love, <clears throat> as I understood 
your argument, it was that effectively it would be beyond the mandate of the tribunal to do anything other than apply the law applicable to it, to the parties before it, and reach what it considered to be the right decision, irrespective of what some other tribunal might have decided, absent raised judicata. My question is, what about the parties? Aren't you focusing too much on whether a tribunal is bound and not enough on whether the parties are bound? And whether the parties are bound is, I think, a question of what the applicable law that that tribunal must apply says about it. And going to my co-arbitrator's question, if the applicable law contains a concept of issue estoppel, then isn't it part of the tribunal's mandate to apply that concept of issue estoppel to the parties before it? And you ended by saying that what a tribunal mustn't do is transpose, was your word, transpose a concept from a domestic court system, which is a system, to an international arbitra arbitration context, which isn't a system, you said. But the uh, international arbitral tribunals still have to apply the applicable law. And if the applicable law includes issue preclusion or some other related doctrine, surely it's part of their task to apply that if the parties are bound in that way. That's my question for Mr. Love. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Gerardo. Well, um, yes, Ms. Martinez Lopez, you've been stimulated to follow up. I have. I just have a follow-up question to, to one of the very interesting questions posed by my co-arbitrators, and it relates to, to the applicable law to these issues. You know, what is in the submission of both parties the applicable law to these particular issues? Should it be the law of the seat, and if so, which seat? The, the seat of the arbitration number one, arbitration number two, the law of the, the substantive law of the contract, should it be some kind of transnational um, justice? And my question this time is about what, what should be the case? I'm aware of the variety of um, results that, that we see in arbitral uh, jurisprudence. Well, th thank you, Ms. Martinez Lopez. So um, I'm I'm the beneficiary of having my my colleagues go before me and having covered so much ground. So I do not have so much to add to this. You'll probably be relieved to know, uh, since you have to address these questions shortly. But but there are a couple of things that I would like to to uh, uh, ask that that have not been covered. Uh, and the first really is a question for Mr. Batifor. Uh, Mr. Love suggested that creating a first-in-time rule would establish a perverse incentive uh, for, for tribunals uh, in, in a perhaps competing situation to rush to, rush to judgment. Um, would you please comment on that point in your uh, rebuttal remarks? I would also like to hear you address, Mr. Badifor, the question of new evidence and how you would deal with the emergence when we're, at least when we're talking about findings of fact or perhaps conclusions of law that are based on those findings of fact um, uh, the, and how that might affect your submission that there ought to be a binding rule. Should there be exceptions? <laughs> should, 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 should the tribunal have, have escape clauses that would allow it to, to, to consider that, that a rule should not be applied. Uh, those would be my questions that it would be helpful for you to address. And um, for, for, for Mr. Love, uh, uh, I, I'd, I'd say uh, I'd like you to address whether there is any difference. I mean, we've talked about related parties. We've talked about related claims. We've talked about relief uh, and, and, and different dimensions of relatedness, as it were, that could bear on these issues. But, but uh, uh, are they all really the same? Or, I mean, one, when you talk about related parties, one, one may, uh, uh, one, one, that, that may be one scenario, but, but aren't treaty and contract claims arguably different, even if some of the facts come into play. So uh, 
uh, I, I think it would be helpful for you to address whether whether uh, uh, all three dimensions of this are entitled to equal consideration or equal weight, um, and and uh, or whether you see them as playing out differently, including in terms of of, of your issue of mandate, and perhaps this ties into the applicable law point we were just making uh, a, a moment ago. So those would be the questions I would ask. I would also love to hear you both say more uh, apropos of Ms. Martinez Lopez's comments about other tools that may be relevant. Um, I mean, this is really a policy decision that we're gonna make at the end of the day. Uh, and and uh, uh, so we need to consider carefully all the policy considerations. And one would be if there are other tools that would be effective. And perhaps you could comment in particular on, on how useful consolidation mechanisms would be uh, to deal with this problem. But those are the questions I have uh, following, following uh, the questions of my colleagues and your presentations. So Emma, now I turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you to you and your co-arbitrators uh, for those very interesting and thoughtful questions. And I will hand it over to our debaters to tackle them. Uh, Simon, would you like to start? Sure, thank you, Emma. Um, there's a lot to tackle, but I'll try my best. Um, I'll start with the, uh, the questions from uh, Madam Arbitrator Martinez Lopez. Um, I think your first question raises two issues. The first issue is um, whether, the, whether we can achieve those desirable policy goals of efficiency, legal coherence, finality by introducing specific language in the BITs. And as you said, this is really a question about the means to implement the desirable rule. Um, so I think once we figure out the right rule, then yes, it can be introduced in the BITs with the caveat that we know that amending BITs is not such an easy task for many reasons. The second issue raised by your first question, I believe is whether the right rule should be the one we're discussing today. And I think Madam Chair's question was also getting at that um, or whether doctrines such as consolidation or abuse of rights are better tools to address the problems. Um, I think tools like consolidation can be problematic in cases involving essentially the same claims. To understand this, you can refer to the CME uh, case that I mentioned. And um, I believe Mr. Love was saying, you know, we don't really understand the reasons why the Czech Republic refused to consolidate and basically suggesting that the state is, has only itself to blame for the fiasco. But in fact, the, there's no need to speculate. It's spelled out in the decision. It's explained that the Czech Republic did not want consolidation because it rejected the premise that two related claimants could assert essentially the same claims in the same case. That's, that was the problem, according to the Czech Republic. So you can have consolidation where it makes sense, but the problem, the fundamental problem raised by the Czech Republic is there should not even be this second set of claims. The CME tribunal, by the way, we saw was unconvinced by that, but the RSCOM tribunal later on was. The doctrine of abuse of rights, uh, Madam Arbitrator, you mentioned that as well, which was applied in RSCOM. Um, and in, in a way, this also, in a way, uh, uh, addresses um, Mr. Jurastovich's uh, question with respect to, you know, what is there a tension between these two cases? Um, you know, are we, is there some sort of inconsistency? I think it, 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 you have to concede that there is, RSCOM sort of presents an alternative uh, a way of dealing with the, um, the, the, the same problem but it comes from the same place of avoiding relitigation of claims um, concerning the same dispute. So um, the, the doctrine of abuse of rights, I would say also abuse of process, uh, it's an interesting one, but it's received pushback 
in the context of international arbitration for being too vague, difficult to operationalize. Um, I would say the principle we're debating today, which comes close to collateral estoppel, issue preclusion, doctrines like this, which can draw from the long experience of national courts in many countries in applying similar rules. And I guess this goes to, the, to your question, Madam Chair, also about the implementation uh, of, the, of, of the rule and whether there should be exceptions, for example, for new evidence. That's actually a well-known exception to the doctrine of issue preclusion or collateral estoppel. So I think you know, that maybe we should have an, a second debate about once we accept this particular motion, how should we implement it ex uh, exactly? Should there be certain exceptions? Should there be nuances taken from the long lines of British cases, uni uh, United States cases applying similar doctrines? Okay, the, the second question raised by uh, Arbitrary Martinez Lopez, um, maybe it's a bit of a trick question, if I may say so. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief by saying that, as, as was recognized, the question for today's debate is not about what rule applies internationally or in various systems of law. Uh, that said, I, I, I'm not going to completely avoid the question. I will say that when looking comparatively, you often encounter rules which on their face seem very different, but in the application of the rules, you often find similarities in the outcomes that are reached. In comparative law, there is something called the principle of similarity. That's, that's what it's referring to. And so I wouldn't be surprised if when you actually looked at the implementation of, um, of, of, of the rules in common law and civil law countries, you found a lot more similarity than uh, you, you thought at the outset. You raised the question, Madam Arbitrator, of uh, the kind of rule we should have. Should it be based on the, uh, the, the applicable law uh, to the contract? Should it be based on the seat of the arbitration? Um, and then you raised the question of whether it should be a transnational rule. I believe I, I would argue that it should be the third option. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, in a way, the, this current situation and this conceptual difficulties that are raised uh, in today's debate are due to the fact that there are so many different roles that apply. This is what motivated this session. And so what this, and this is why the session is um, styled as a should rather than what, it, what is it? Because it's very difficult to say what it is depends on a lot of, um, uh, on looking at the different um, systems of law. And so I would say a transnational rule would be uh, preferable. And on the questions raised by um, Mr. Dragovic, shall I address the first question? I'll, I'll, I'll go to the second one. Um, should there be a, um, a, a stay when you have, for example, a contract tribunal uh, seized of a question relating to the application of the contract um, when uh, a treaty tribunal, for example, is tasked with interpreting the, the terms of the contract because those are the terms that define the contours of the investment for the purposes of the application of the investment treaty. I would say that's a very interesting question, which also goes to the implementation of the rule. And uh, the, the, the point to keep in mind, I believe, is that um, is that um, you know there, 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 there are many um, declinations to um, and and as we saw treaty claim versus treaty claim treaty claim versus contract claims and all of this needs to be explored and fleshed out um, but that's that's part of the second debate I believe that we evoke um, so in terms of uh, Madam Chair's question. The, uh, does the first-in-time rule create a perverse in, in, incentive? Um, I, I, I think it's it's a, it's also a difficult question in the sense that um, uh, the, the, I understand the I understand the point raised, but the, I think the answer to that is that you have to give priority to one of the tribunals. So the question becomes: Which tribunal should it be? And I think um, Mr. Love said that it's, it's wholly arbitrary to expect the second tribunal to follow the findings of the first one. 
you know, he made that point in the context of CME after saying that after blaming the state for his decision not to consolidate the cases. I would say, you know, when you think about it, isn't there a tension between those two arguments? Because as we know, when related cases are consolidated, the disputes are normally joined before the first tribunal, not the second one. This means that the first tribunal takes priority in that scenario. So the point is that one proceeding has to take precedence over the other. And when you, th when you think about it, you know, should it be the second or the first one? It's more efficient to give priority to the proceeding initiated at a later stage, and that's more advanced rather than the other one. So it's a, it's a difficult choice to make, but you have to make a choice. And the natural choice is the first tribunal, like in the case consolidation. Um, Emma, I'm not sure if I have any time left to address some of the other points made by Ben. If you'd wish to take a, a minute or two, Simon, I think that would be fine. Okay, thank you. Looking at my note briefly to gain time, not to waste time. All right, I'll, I'll make a, few, a couple of points. Ben argued that arbitra arbitral tribunals cannot have an obligation to respect the findings of other tribunals because they have a case specific mandate, he cited Professor Riesman. But if that proposition as stated was true, there would be no concept of res judicata in arbitration. Each tribunal would have to resolve independently any dispute brought before it, regardless of whether a tribunal has already ruled on the same dispute. We know that that's not right. The doctrine of res judicata is generally accepted in arbitration. So the real question is whether that the rationale of that doctrine should extend to other situations. I've addressed most of the points made uh, on CME. Uh, just one more, which uh, uh, Mr. Love said that, or suggested that CME reflected the normal operation of the arbitral system, the expectations of uh, uh, um, uh, of contracting states to investment treaties. I say, you know, is that really true? Does anyone think that what the Czech, that, that the Czech Republic's reaction when it saw the first decision saying it had nothing wrong, and then it saw the second decision blaming it for intentionally coercing the claimant, that reflects the normal operation of the arbitral system? I don't, I, I doubt it. Uh, just, just very briefly on the on the final set of additional cases that uh, Mr. Love mentioned, uh, the, um, the those were unnamed cases. I'm not sure which uh, uh, which ones they are, but uh, it, it it seemed that the the tribunals expressed different views on how binding each award should be in subsequent cases and how to approach those questions. Um, to me, these cases seem to indicate two things. First, tribunals seem to understand that they should take into account the findings of other tribunals rather than plow through with blinders on the basis that they have a case-specific mandate. And second, the fact that the tribunals may have adopted somewhat different approaches does not mean that there's no better way to handle successive decisions in related disputes. Today's debate is precisely about how tribunals should handle such issues. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Simon. There's a lot there. Ben, over to you. Okay, thank you, Emma. I will uh, try to get to all the points. Uh, I'll start with the, the question from arbitrator Martinez Lopez. Um, so, so I think the first question was essentially, um, do we have enough tools, do arbitrators have enough tools at their disposal to deal with um, the potential inconsistencies that could arise from uh, related arbitrations? Um, or do we need to expand on these tools um, through um, direct uh, treaty language uh, dealing with issues such as consolidation, successive arbitrations, um, et cetera? Um, I, I think, you know, um, you know, a very kind of well-known commentator has, has recently remarked on uh, the dangers posed by silence 
and treaties. And I think these are issues on which I think we can all agree investment treaties up until this point have been silent. And so arbitrators have to be very careful when assessing uh, what tools are at their disposal to handle this, lest they become and make themselves out to be lawmakers instead of law appliers. And I, I think that there's a related question, you know, that came second about RSM and whether this doctrine, the statement that collateral estoppel um, is generally recognized as a principle of international law. And um, I, I, I think that uh, it, it is right to question whether collateral estoppel um, is a principle of international law, given that it's not a principle of uh, many national legal systems. So that that is, you know, illustrates precisely my point about arbitrators needing to be careful when they're wading into situations on which treaties are silent. Um, there is another mechanism that international tribunals have long employed to deal with the issue that arose in RSM and, and uh, some of the other cases, and, and that is the distinction between primary and secondary jurisdiction. And I, and I would argue that effectively, and, and I think Mr. Batifo was, was right to raise this, um, you know, kind of effective uh you know, result of different uh, tribunals or different legal systems, you know, as, as a point of reference. I, I think effectively what RSM said in the language um, that um, it quoted about BIT tribunals not existing to overturn or second guess uh, decided questions of municipal law, um, precisely because they don't have primary jurisdiction over those questions. That's really the pointed issue there. And I think the reason, or uh, one of the reasons why uh, that tribunal got it right in that particular case. That, of course, you know, is a much narrower proposition than uh, tribunals, you know, should always uh, defer to the first-in-time tribunal when deciding these issues. Um, and so th I think this leads to, um, uh, to uh, arbitrator Jaradovich's question about, you know, you know, asking about why I was addressing what tribunals could do and how they could bind each other, but not about the parties. And I, I think that's, you know, incredibly important because it, looking at precisely who the parties are to each arbitration is important in figuring out whether uh, one tribunal's decision might have bound the other. And, and I think the question there, you know, can both be one of identity of the parties, but it can also be um, one of whether the parties in that first arbitration were in the first place. The first question that has to be um, asked is whether the decision that they received in that first arbitration would constitute a, a race judicata on the international plane. And I think um, you know, the, the, that this question of our applicable law that um, uh, Mr. Jaradovich raised is, is prescient because in a commercial arbitration, what would be the applicable law of answering that question, whether the arbitral decision is a race judicata that should be um, recognized by um, other tribunals? Well, really, what is an arbitral decision in the commercial context? It is a piece of paper that you know, the dispositive part of it comes to be recognized in a national court, and it has whatever race judicata effect that national court would give it within that national legal system. And so then there becomes a second question of whether the arbitral tribunal that may be constituted pursuant to the laws of a completely different arbitral seat is somehow bound to recognize what is effectively just a, a, a national race judicata or whether there's some international effect. And I, I, I think there's a reason that these aren't settled issues. And I think it's because the national laws that apply in most arbitral seats don't answer them. Um, now, for an international arbitration, you know, a truly international arbitration, like an exit arbitration that has no seat, um, the arbitrators would have to look at, um, uh, you know, customary international law as a gap filler uh, to determine what tools are at their disposal. And I, I think at this point, um, we're, we're not at a stage where customary international law goes much further beyond um, you know, establishing a basic rule of race judicata. Um, I, I don't think that uh, there is a rule of collateral estoppel.
for instance, and I think there are a number of other issues on which customary international law is silent uh, for what I think are effectively uh, you know, procedural questions with substantive uh, implications. Um, and so this, so um, Madam Chairman had asked, you know, if there's any difference between, you know, the various issues that, that uh, come to light here, you know, whether we're looking at the same parties or the same issues, uh, the same relief sought, whether there can be any difference. Um, I, you know, again, going back to, uh, to the parties issue. I think it's incredibly important that, um, you know, parties only be bound by um, uh, arbitrations that they have agreed to. Now, I think there is an exception when you have a treaty um, arbitration that turns on, you know, the issues of liability under the treaty turn on issues of an underlying contract. Um, and if those issues in the underlying contract have been decided by the tribunal that the parties to that contract chose to decide them, um, then that should be an exception to um, a complete identity of the parties. And I don't think that that's an exception necessarily to a complete identity of the issues because in a situation like this, um, the contractual issues that were put into play in the treaty arbitration would be precisely the same issues that are put in, that were decided by the uh, contractual um, uh, form. Um, so now going to Mr. Batifo's uh, a few points about um, my earlier remarks. Um, he, he, he remarks that because race judicata is generally accepted, that tribunals don't operate with a case-specific mandate. Um, but I think this really ignores the important point, which is that the application of race judicata in a particular case is subject to a number of, um, of specific requirements. Um, and you know, whether those requirements have been met is you know, precisely the question um, when you're looking at a case-specific mandate. And so in the case of uh, CME and Lauder, you have different parties and you have different treaties. Um, what you, you know, what's identical or what's at least overlapping are the um, economic interest um, in question. And it's not so much that this reflected a normal situation, that wasn't the point I was making, but it does reflect the default situation of the, you know, I hate to use the word system because it's not a system, but of the existence of so many different um, international treaties that allow for overlapping interests to be represented under different arbitral mechanisms. Now, to the extent that's not desirable, the treaties can be changed, the arbitral mechanisms can start incorporating rules for um, consolidation and other uh, tools for dealing with um, these sorts of situations. And you know, the state has the option of agreeing to consolidation as well. Um, and I think the third point that Mr. Batifor made that I want to address is, you know, the characterization that I was saying that, you know, the case specific mandate of a tribunal means that it plows through with blinders, you know, without looking at the uh, decisions of tribunals in related cases. That's not the point I'm making. Tribunals are, of course, um, and, 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 and really should look at the decisions of other tribunals in related cases. But the point there is absent some very specific conditions being met for those decisions to be binding in another arbitration, um, you know, the tribunals still have to carry out their own mandate, which is to get it right in that case. And so if the tribunal, say in CME, does not consider that the tribunal in Lauder got it right, there, there is nothing in law uh, compelling it to uh, reach a decision other than the one that it thinks is right. And I'll uh, close there. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to both of our debaters who, who I think saved for a couple of audience questions which we have received, which I hope we'll have time to get to at the end, on which each of you may wish to comment. Uh, I, think, I think your work is largely done, and I will hand over to our distinguished tribunal.
uh, where we will have the privilege of seeing the tribunal's decision, uh, I beg your pardon, deliberations, uh, query whether they will wish to reach a, a decision on the motion, um, but certainly, as I said at the outset, we will have another poll, so the audience will reach a decision uh, for or against the motion before we wrap up today. Over to you, Madam President. Thank you very much, Emma. Well, uh, I, I don't know if we will reach a decision or not. We'll have to see what the deliberations yield, but we will try to leave time for the questions and of course the polling question at the end and, and it's in its decision. And I would just reiterate the disclaimer that you gave at the beginning that, that uh, uh, the views everyone is expressing here uh, are, are, are views for purposes of debate and discussion and do not necessarily represent one's personal views. So uh, we are asked uh, uh, not, not to um, issue a decision with respect to race judicata, uh, uh, but, but, but to issue a decision as to whether there should be a binding character, a binding character of decisions of other tribunals in uh, related cases. So something certainly I, I agree with the, you, Ms. Martinez Lopez, perhaps closer to collateral estoppel, but not just uh, not just based on similarity of issues, but a broader uh, a broader formulation. And we've heard uh, from Simone that that uh, uh, such a rule would avoid the chaos and 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 and, and credibility issues. Uh, that impair the legitimacy of the system. Uh, I, I do have some questions about if, 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 if we have to go to a second round to determine whether this would be workable, how much doubt that casts on the validity of the position you advocate for, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for discussion. And then we've had a very vigorous uh, view expressed from Mr. Love that it would be really beyond the mandate uh, of, of a tribunal uh, to do so, and that there are other ways to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, take into account uh, the, the decisions of other tribunals. But of course, that does leave us at the end of the day with the CME louder situation, where if it's not binding, you could have those different results. Uh, and I think we have to be mindful that we live in, at a time when many are questioning the overall legitimacy of, and I am gonna use the word system because I think the architecture uh, allows us to use that word in a qualified way. So let me, with those introductory remarks, I, uh, ask each of my co-arbitrators to express their views and, and thanking again the, the, the two debaters for their yeoman efforts to address our many questions in a short period of time. Carmen, may I start with you? Sure. Um, we, we actually did hear excellent presentations from, from both and excellent answers to our difficult question, which, by the way, were, were actually not staged. So, you know, extra credit to our uh, to, to both Ben and, and Simon for that. Um, I am not convinced that an arbitral tribunal should necessarily bind other tribunals subsequently uh, deciding related disputes on the same issues of, of fact or law. I could be convinced to a certain extent that um, it should be extended to different parties. Uh, Mr. Love in his last remark said, perhaps in the context of contract versus treaty, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain I see why in those cases, yes, and not in others, but I certainly can see why some of the cases that Mr. Uh, Batifo referred to make a compelling case for expanding the res judicata doctrine to cases where you don't have necessarily the same parties, you know, uh, shareholders being claimants um, in, in, one, in one of the arbitrations versus the company, at least in those cases in which it's all of the shareholders, it's of course going to be a, a slightly more complicated issue when uh, when it's not all of them or when you have a minority shareholder. But I think you could perhaps apply a common law style rule of privity of interest. You know, do they effectively represent the same interest? And, and I think there are some examples of that, including the Apotex Tribunal. So I, I could be convinced on, on, on that. Um, where, where I'm not, where I have more difficulty is 
you know, on, on the two other requirements of res judicata, of the traditional res judicata, if I may put it like that, you know, same claim, same, same cause of action. Uh, I don't think there's a sound legal basis to disregard those requirements. I think we, we, uh, we heard Mr. Love argue that, you know, arbitration is case specific by design. I think that's, that certainly is a good point. We heard him say that the first in time rule is, is a bit arbitrary. I, I would agree with that. Um, it, it can also create more problems than it solves. And I think um, the example that he gave us about the, the uh, Israeli Egypt gas um, supply agreement do exemplify some, some of those problems. But in addition to those points that were pointed out by Mr. Love, I, I think we, we must uh, always remember that we're talking about limiting the right of access to justice from claimants here. And so we have to be particularly careful when we're, when we're trying to expand uh, res judicata in, in that manner, because we are talking about a fundamental premise of, of due process here. And then there's another point that I didn't hear the parties comment on, which is clarity, predictability, and ease of application of the rule. Because as we have, as we have it, you know, a, a, a traditional uh, res judicata rule applies strictly, is way easier to predict, way clearer, and way easier to apply than some more nebulous concept of uh, issue preclusion or an expanded res judicata uh, theory, call it as you like, uh, it does become, I think, a little bit more uh, uh, subjective and, and less clear and, and, and predictable. Um, there's, of course, a, a related point uh, to which ma Madam uh, President, I think you were alluding to, which is, you know, the, what do we do with new evidence? Is it, is it really workable to have this? So, you know, even a new admission on crop that kind of changes everything, you know, what does the, the second tribunal do with that? Um, and then there's a point that I was making to the parties, and, and you know, I think issue preclusion is not recognized as a general rule in most civil, civil law systems. Precisely for those reasons, we heard Mr. Batifor make a, a very interesting comment where I think he's, he's probably somehow correct that, you know, perhaps in a lot of civil law countries, we don't call it like that, but we get to the same result. Uh, that, that, that I think is true to a certain extent, uh, but, but, not, but not fully. Um, and, it, it, you know, if courts are not bound by the prior decisions of other courts, why should arbitrary tribunals, which are specifically created and mandated to decide the specific case at stake, be bound by prior decisions of other arbitrary tribunals? Um, it also leads to, to difficult um, uh, issues in practice where, you know, you, you may have different arbitrary tribunals or different decisions in, the, in, the, in, in national courts actually not uh, being binding on, on the other tribunals, but then when you when you get to the international arbitration level, those should be binding, which, which I think is, will be a, a, a difficult one. In any event, two last points um, be, before I conclude. I don't think we're seeing big injustices here um, in, this, in, this, um, in this arena these days. You know, we always talk about Lauder CME. Well, it, I think it's an outlier. It's becoming quite old these days. The Czech Republic refused to consolidate. I don't think since then we've seen a lot of those um, that, that, that actually would support the need to change what we currently apply as, as, as res judicata. And in fact, I think that's why BITs are, are, are actually not, uh, they haven't been modified to address this issue because I don't think it is, um, uh, you know, it is perhaps an issue that as you pointed out, Madam Chair, it's becoming more and more uh, recurrent, but I don't think it's leading to, to, to unfair results um, as a matter of routine. And, 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 and to the extent that we need them, there are other mechanisms out there. I think consolidation is indeed an interesting one. I certainly see the point that Mr. Batifo was making about abuse of process and whether that creates more problems that it solves. Because as we all know, abuse of process is a bit of a controversial doctrine and, and, and perhaps or not for, for good reasons, but um, but I do think that we that we that we have other mechanisms that doesn't require us to expand the concept of res judicata, which again at the end of the day is trying to to uh, to find an equilibrium between a basic principle of access to justice uh, and and principles of finality. Um, and excellent, thank you very much for those very thoughtful and comprehensive comments. Uh, uh, let me turn to, to you, Ben um, Juratovich, for, for your observations and views, if you wish to express them. 
on Thanks the display or otherwise. Thanks very much, Lucinda. And I very much enjoyed Simon's and Ben's presentation. So first of all, thanks very much to them. And Carmen saved me quite a bit of work. So thanks to Carmen too for all her interesting comments just now. I, I was glad that the topic of consolidation and stays came up. And I think a lot can be achieved through the clever use of procedure to avoid a number of problems that might otherwise arise in this context. Uh, and <clears throat> Simon addressed the Czech Republic refusing to consolidate in CME and Lauda, uh, but the Czech objection could easily have been decided by one tribunal addressing consolidated claims. Uh, normally, if there's a sensible basis for consolidation, and there reasonably often is, the party resisting it is doing so to be disruptive or otherwise difficult or to hedge risk. Uh, and it's a pity, I think, that institutional rules don't more often allow for consolidation to be ordered, even in the face of a disruptive party, because consolidation can quite often solve a number of these problems. Uh, so I was glad that that was being dealt with. And I think that's an important aspect of this. And related to that stays, which was also addressed, stays can be extremely useful because sometimes there is a situation where it makes sense to wait and see what someone else says, not because you necessarily regard yourself as being bound by it, but because it's relevant. Uh, and so you wait and see what the answer is. Claimants don't always like it, but it can often be quite a sensible, orderly way to proceed through an overall dispute that involves multiple tribunals if consolidation is not possible. So I was glad to see procedure being dealt with. And in my view, it's even more important than uh, the emphasis that was put on it today. On substance, um, I didn't understand Simon's answer to my question about uh, abusive process. The point I was trying to make, perhaps inarticulately, is that if there's an abusive process question, then the claim stops there because there's an abusive process. But if there's not an abusive process, then the claim carries on, and then we come to the applicable law. If under the applicable law, there's some sort of doctrine of preclusion that's applicable, whether you call it collateral estoppel or issue estoppel or something else, but something that's not raised judicata properly so-called, but nonetheless controls the outcome of a claim brought by a party, then that applies. Uh, and then if you don't have abusive process and you don't have through the applicable law, some form of preclusion, then it seems to me it's clearly the job of the tribunal to go on and make the decision on the basis of the law and the facts before it. And that might or might not be the same as a tribunal that's previously considered related facts or a related dispute. But I do think it's very important to remember that we're not talking about one tribunal binding another. So technically speaking, the answer to this proposition is of course not. One tribunal shouldn't follow another tribunal. The question is whether the parties are affected and then one of those parties is before another tribunal and the tribunal in applying a law applicable to its dispute should regard the parties as not being free to advance some proposition that's contrary to what's been found against them in some previous case. Or this goes to Carmen's point about privity of interests. Uh, and that I think is really the hot topic because if I'm right about applicable law, the real issue is for investment treaties, which has formed a significant part of this discussion, is there issue estoppel or collateral estoppel or issue preclusion or whatever label you want to put on the tin, does that exist when the applicable law is public international law in the form of an investment treaty? Not because it's in the treaty itself, but because of it's one of, it's one of the pieces of international law that hangs around the outside of an, an investment treaty, which an international tribunal applying the investment treaty can have recourse to, just like it has recourse to rules of state responsibility or other aspects of general international law. And that seems to me to be the real issue. Is there issue preclusion under public international law as applied in the context of investment treaties? And if there is, does it apply in the context, not just where the parties are the same, but where the interests are the same. And when there really is the same interests, uh, 
and they're really claiming for the same facts and claiming what would be overlapping damage, uh, then it may well be that abusive process is an appropriate doctrine. So you might never get to the question, but when if you do get to the substantive question, that seems to me to be the difficult part. So my um, answer to the question would be, if it's about one tribunal binding another, of course not. Uh, if it's a question about whether or not parties are precluded in some way from advancing something that's been found against them or a related party or a related interest. Well, the answer to that, of course, is it depends. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I see, Emma, that we have five minutes left. I think, I think it's pretty clear we're going to have unanimity of the tribunal on the question that was put before us and none of us believes that that there should be binding effect on the tribunals. I, I won't detail uh, or, or repeat anything that has been, been said by my colleagues. I think we've laid out uh, the issues and I think we do see that there is an issue to be addressed. It may not be, be, be best addressed through a rule of binding effect but I think we've explored problems that do not have an easy solution in the current architecture. If we had more time, I would talk more about consolidation and how that has worked or not worked in, in some treaty situations that I'm very familiar with. Um, and, and, and earlier in my career, I, I, I fought off a consolidation attempt by by Mexico under the NAFTA's consolidation provisions. And I've expressed the view since then that, that, that the threshold for consolidation in that treaty was, is perhaps too low because it turns on a common question of fact or law. But, but uh, so there's a lot we could talk about on, on, uh, on the procedural front as well as on the substantive front. And, and uh, uh, but I do think we've 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 provided through the excellent arguments of both parties a lot of food for thought on these issues, and perhaps uh, uh, there should be a follow-up debate to to deepen the some of the points that have been laid bare by this discussion. Uh, for example, on 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 issue preclusion and and the effects of applicable. Law. I, mean, I, I don't think a primary and secondary distinction really, I mean, that, that could be a partial answer in some cases, but it doesn't really get to the situation. That, for example, if you have two simultaneous investment treaty tribunals constituted with overlapping questions, then you do have to look to things like, 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 like other doctrines such as a possible stay. And that's an issue that comes up in some other contexts as well. So uh, more food for thought for the future. Uh, why don't we go to the questions that we have from, from the audience, which we can't see. So you will need to put them to us. I certainly will. And I'm pleased to say, given the time that remains, that the discussion has covered a number of them. Um, so I will leave them to one side and perhaps just throw out a, a couple of the remaining questions uh, for any of our speakers who might like to tackle them. And while the speakers are considering those questions, we'll perhaps run the second poll. But here, here, are, here are, we're running a second poll, I think, right now. So let's get that out of the way. Um, so have your views changed? It's the same one we had at the beginning of the session. Let's see where we come out now, having heard our speakers. The motion fails. <laughs> 
uh, today quite clearly. The debate has shifted our audience. Uh, we've gone up from about half disagreeing with the motion to about three quarters. Um, and, and the don't knows have reduced considerably as well. Um, so, so thank you all for that. Um, perhaps just one question to end on in, in the time that remains, and I'm sorry that we haven't had a chance to get to more of these, um, but there's of course, and, and Ben Jaratovich picked up on this, much of our discussion has focused on investment treaty arbitration and in certain circumstances, it's overlap with uh, contract arbitrations, commercial arbitrations. Are there different considerations or should there be different considerations at play where we're dealing exclusively with commercial arbitrations? I'm happy to go first on that if you like, Emma, um, <clears throat> which is, no, not really. The, 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 the applicable law might be different. And so you need to look at what the applicable law says as to all of these issues. But I don't think the policy considerations are any different. Insofar as publicity is concerned, it's a pity that so many commercial arbitral awards are not available to the public in some form or another, uh, but they will be available to the parties. And one sometimes sees parties say, well, I can't make this available to the other tribunal because it's confidential to the other arbitration. That's, I think, often quite a bad argument in most circumstances. And just because it can't be made public to the world at large doesn't mean it can't be made available to another tribunal dealing with a related question concerning related parties. Uh, so the contours might be different, but my answer to that question would be not really. Thank you, Ben. Well, I think, thank you for that, Ben. I think we are out of time. And I will say to the organisers, there have been a number of uh, questions in the chat as to a CLE code. So perhaps uh, someone could follow up with attendees about that. But it remains for me um, to thank our debaters, our tribunal members, um, to thank New York Arbitration Week again and the American Society of International Law. Um, thank you all and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you.